It's the hardest position to try to be, the middle, because it puts one outside of the two factions of the dream war. On the right side, God demands obedience in exchange for contentment. On the left side, the devil also demands obedience in exchange for power. When watched from the outside, it becomes evident that one is an inverted reflection of the other, a pentagram pointing up or a pentagram pointing down, a crucifix pointing up or a crucifix pointing down. One favors so-called white hats, the other favors so-called black hats. One is prideful and uses shame, the other is shameful and uses pride. So, to try to be in the middle is to be hated by both sides and loved by neither of those two. For those involved in the conflict, for one to have no commitment to either side is worse than to be committed to the opposition. It's sort of like those women on either side of a war who used to shun men who did not voluntarily enlist in the army to fight that war. Cowards, they would call them, even when they had taken the hardest and least popular of all choices. The bottom line is that false good depends on the existence of false evil to be of value, and vice versa. False good and evil rely on each other's existence to be what they are, as neither is independent. Without each other, they would not subsist and maintain their form. Therefore, both false good and evil serve the world realm. It is not by chance that one of the most prominent symbols of Freemasonry is the checkered floor, for instance, because they stand on both factions, assisting both and help to keep the script going. And to maintain it, they need to feed the conflict of good and evil within the realm by playing both sides sometimes by promoting facts and often by spreading lies. Individuals like them, who have chosen a commitment to the realm itself to worship and guard, see themselves above good and evil, as far as rules of conduct go, yet they are unable to actually go beyond them in a truthful way. They just stand on both good and evil. However, there exists, indeed, an invisible and intangible space in between the metaphorical white and black squares. And that space is living. It is true, and it is metaphorically colorless. Note here, colorless not as in made up of all or any colors, like the rainbow, but without any of the colors, not even white or black. That space is also where the true love for the ones who try to be in the middle emerges from, and has always been. So, being that this invisible space is from truth, shining colorless through the colorful filters of the realm, neither side of false good and evil can come to it and maintain their form. In its presence, the constructs of the realm are revealed and unmasked, and illusion crumbles. Used here as just an example of realm and script enforcers, the Masons fear that invisible space in between their precious squares, because they fear the uncatalogued, as that which is uncatalogued is also unpredictable. This realm is made up of predictability, and all minds in it, be it man, animal, or even plant, rely on its predictability. In the same manner that God instructed his created man to catalog and name all creation, so did the devil instruct his minions to do the same. What is the difference in purpose between, for example, a baptism certificate and a citizen card? The purpose is the same. It is for God and or the devil to know and recognize the individual in question and to make their relationship predictable. Neither side truly offers any choice or any true love, for both treat any deviation from the rules, 
rules here as a set of programs that promote their needed predictability as a statement of alignment with the enemy, unless there is repentance from that transgression against the respective side's rules. Both sides are able to accept repentance up to a certain degree, but neither can truly offer any redemption. Redemption comes from the realization that to be in the world does not mean that one has to be from the world. Likewise, to be amidst the war does not mean that one should fight it for either side. There is a famous quote used in different variants that is quite accurate for this realm, which goes, The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men should do nothing. Indeed, this is a fact. Yet whenever good was prevalent, even if we are to consider the beginning of the beginnings of this realm, and the degree of good much purer than we are able to conceive now, did it not fall after time regardless? Why would it ever have fallen if that pre prevalent good was truth? It fell just like evil also always falls in time, for the same reason because it is not truth. Truth never falls, exactly because it is absolute, and this realm can only ever present relativity, that is, interdependency at all levels. It is we that are able to, by contemplation, realization and choice, align with the absolute while still in this divided and relative state. And we can even also see that the inversion of that mentioned quote is also accurate for this realm. The only thing necessary for the triumph of good is that evil men should do nothing. What is the difference in essence between them then? Both are false and destructible without commitment. So commitment is the fuel for both sides and therefore the fuel for the realm itself. And yet Truth exists behind it, but it finds us neither in the white square nor in the black square. It is beyond and it finds us when we try to stand in that invisible, intangible space in between both squares. In that sense, if the realm is represented by a checkered floor and is in essence a war game, like in the movie of the same name, the only winning move is not to play within possibility, limitations and wisdom, of course. Picking up the Christian mythos, one can see this truth shining through in the outline, between the lines of detail, for instance in these passages, for your contemplation. Luke 22, 49-52 When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, No more of this? And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard and the elders, who had come for him, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? So, was the character who represents truth fighting a war as both sides see it as necessary and fit? Matthew 10, 16-22 I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard, you will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death, and the father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death you will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. 
Was this not guidance to try to stand in between the snakes and the doves, even though it makes one hated in the world by both kinds of synagogues? Matthew 10, 34-39 Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. So to try to stand in the middle turns even family against oneself, due to the lack of commitment to whatever side they prefer. Yet to lose that script life for the sake of truth is to find true life, which is not a program or a script, but has an independent will and existence, which makes it unpredictable here. A cross, after all, is a central point between two lines. In any case, isn't it evident that both sides, false good and evil, have been guilty of this same persecution? Have there or have there not been hatred on both sides against the other and the neutrals? One feels righteous, the other feels powerful, but neither takes the opportunity to see in the other the reflection of their own fallen essence. That is, the good one is pride and feels shame, the evil one is shame and feels pride. Both feed each other. Both persecute the ones who have realized that life and truth can only be glimpsed at the middle point between the two factions. And this is feared by both sides because both need investment and commitment into the war. However, the realm, although its script runs like a conflict, is not actually a war, but a test. And the test is a question. What do you value most? What is of the utmost importance to you? If the answer is anything within the realm, be it good or evil in the catalogue of both sides, then the test goes on and both factions sigh with relief, because the game continues. Don't get me wrong, it is virtually impossible to truly stand in the middle of the two false sides while existing in the same false state where the whole confrontation takes place, of course. I have realized long ago that neither perfection nor purity is possible or required, much less in our handicapped state. We are all just as divided. However, the intent or decision for redemption comes from both an acceptance of the atonement seen in the opposite reflection, in so far it is used as a means of transmutation of our own original core back into its living counterpart, beyond the confronting duality of the false dream and also the decision to reject with mildness the temptations of war.